Today's businesses are on a vigilant watch for threats in an ongoing cyber war. It's time to get real-world solutions to protect and secure your valuable business information anytime, anywhere. Welcome to Cybersecurity America with Josh Nicholson. You're about to gain special access into a world of restricted information and a backstage pass to the inner sanctum of cybersecurity operations. Here's your host, Josh Joshua Nicholson. So never have a uniform inspection in the middle of a firefight. That's definitely one thing I've learned is when you're in the middle of a cybersecurity incident, that's the last thing you want to be able to do is to sit there and try and figure out what exactly happened and write a big old long uh, email to management. Isn't that one thing we all notice? So welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity America. This is your host again, Joshua Nicholson. And I am glad to be joined here by Kamel Tamimi. Is that how I'm pronouncing that right, Kamel? Yeah. And uh, Kamel is uh, somebody I've known for many years, and him and I worked together, and I can tell you he was just a solid professional. So he was a seasoned cybersecurity expert. He has over 20 years of experience, 10 years of them in sales engineering leadership roles. Now, he's based in Dubai, the Middle East Cybersecurity and Technology Hub. And he's passionate about contributing to the regional digital transformation modernization efforts. And like I was saying before, he and I worked together at CoFence. We had several big clients there in the Middle East. I spent uh, a number of times in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Oman, and throughout the Gulf. Kamal has been well-respected expert throughout that region and just somebody I truly I like and I think he's a great guy. So welcome to the show, Kamal. Nice Thank to you, have Josh. you. Uh, it's nice to be here. Yeah. And so how is everything in Dubai now, my friend? It is thriving. To be honest, the entire region is thriving. Definitely as a region that depends on oil as one of the major sources of income to all the countries within GCC with a stable somehow high oil prices every industry is thriving right and i think when i was over there was a real concern on a lot of oil and gas attacks that was happening in the region is that something that's still a concern or is that kind of it it is always it is always a concern there was the incident uh, uh, a few years back uh, with the physical attack with the drones that was completely unexpected there is some sort of uh, code of honor that's there is no physical attacks, but uh, most countries always expecting cyber attack. Cyber attack never stops, and it's been used as a, a tool for political pressure. Attack on infrastructure, oil and gas companies from different state players for different reasons is a continuous thing. They are always concerned about the cybersecurity attacks. Yeah. Before we get more into that, we're going to have a quick brief Intel brief from our sponsor, Deep Seas. And we encourage everybody to go to deepseas.com if you're interested in managed detection response or highly trained cybersecurity consultants to meet your needs. I highly recommend you check out Deep Seas. But over to Aaron Beerland for the threat intelligence of the week. Aaron? Thank you, Josh. The first thing that I'm going to get to that came across the CTI desk this week here at Deep Seas would be Evil Proxy, which is a phishing as a service cyber criminal group that sells the ability to send out spear phishing emails and can also be used for access sellers as well as other cyber criminals like ransomware operations. Recent reporting shows that Evil Proxy is now targeting a lot of VIPs and executives at different organizations, and it would appear that their new TTPs and implant features allow them the ability to get around certain multi-factor authentication tokens. Obviously, we know that cyber criminals have always tried to find ways to get around multi-factor authentication because that was one of the surest ways to take care of any sort of illicit access that might have come from something like a spear phishing email or a mal mal doc, a malicious document that may have come across. But the idea that these organizations are going to be focusing on things like being able to get around multi-factor authentication, as well as some of the other tactics that we've seen from other cyber criminal groups, like being able to shut down antivirus 
uh, and other things of this nature are things that we always want to keep a really close eye on. Specifically, the targeted campaign of looking at VIPs uh, may be an effort to gain immediate access or gain insight access into something that would be sensitive. What this suggests is you know, being able to get into the email of an executive would likely open up that access to a lot of confidential information that you can then extort with the company, similar to what we saw with Klopp's extortion of uh, several organizations when they compromised the uh, MoveIt uh, data transfer software. This type of activity we've known is going to be a focus of cyber criminals, and we're merely seeing an increase of that and the different methods that criminals are going to use to be able to conduct these types of operations. Additionally, I want to point out a lot of the reporting that we're seeing in regards to China. Recently, there have been several different reports regarding Chinese threat actors. One of the main ones seen by a lot of people would be Microsoft's report on what they call Storm 0558, which is a Chinese-affiliated nation-state actor that they saw compromise several different Microsoft 365 email accounts to include ones at the U.S. Department of State as well as the United States Department of Commerce. There have been a lot of questions about the extent that this threat actor was able to compromise Microsoft systems due to the fact that this threat actor was able to compromise a Microsoft key and then create and generate their own access tokens. According to Microsoft, they have informed anyone that was affected by uh, any of this activity, but the scale of the activity with being able to form your own tokens could expand far beyond something uh, like Outlook email, which was what was compromised in this situation. In addition to that reporting, we also have seen a lot of reporting coming out about the United States government looking through different ICS SCADA systems and critical infrastructure for Chinese malware. And this is coming on the back from in May, as we spoke about on this program, about Volt Typhoon. So there's a lot of focus when it comes to Chinese threat activity, and this likely sits around some of the tensions that we're seeing, increased tensions when it comes to China and Taiwan, recent payments that were made by the United States government. There was, I believe it was $35 million in military aid that was just sent by the United States government to Taiwan, and there's also been some naval exercises that have occurred between Russia and China that got extremely close to the United States, particularly the Aleutian Islands out in Alaska. So a lot of these increased tensions go right along with the assessment that we have here at Deep Seas that we will see increased Chinese nation state activity as more diplomatic efforts are made and more tension increases when it comes to the decision as to what the status is for Taiwan while China starts ramping up what appears to be their want to declare Taiwan officially part of China and as well as obviously the United States and the United States and European partners uh, having to attempt to figure out diplomatic methods with which that does not occur or how they may respond. And uh, this could be a very similar situation to what we saw between Russia and Ukraine. And we advise all of our clients at Deep Seas to develop a contingency plan if they have operations within China to understand what effect that type of activity may work, may have, what effect sanctions may have on your operations, and what effect um, may occur if China decides that they do not want companies affiliated with the United States government operating within their country. Uh, so that's some of the suggestions that we make. And as always, you're able to contact us directly, CTI at Deep Seas. Com if you have any further questions. Other than that, back to you, Josh. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate that. That was a very enlightening update. So, Camel, you were talking about what the what is so different about the Middle East right now compared to other regions. And I'm really curious, how has things changed since I was over there and the Ukrainian war had kicked off? How is the cybersecurity threat over there in the Middle East at this time? Most of the countries within this region are trying to stay on a neutral ground, like they condemned, of, of course, the, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, but they still depends on a lot of political, economical relationship with Russia and the Russian-packed country. 
officially most of the the countries will send like humanitarian aid to ukraine are trying to condemn aggressions but also they want to stay somehow neutral um which also put them in in the uh, spotlight for cyber attacks from both sides as i said cyber security attacks used for political gain for political activism many of them of course uh, are state sponsored the main changes within this region is cloud adoption has become a thing in this region most countries were concerned about data and data sovereignty uh, which is uh, very understandable that you want your data especially if you are countries depends on critical infrastructure like oil and gas and utility companies and you have mm-hmm. a huge financial system you want to ensure that uh, uh, data sovereignty. So many cloud provider had already started building data centers within uh, the region. So Google had opened a couple of data center within uh, several countries, Amazon, Azure, uh, Oracle Cloud, uh, Alibaba. So now you're gonna, there is a booming in, in, in a cloud adoption because now the a major player uh, in the uh, cloud uh, infrastructure and uh, hyperscaler are opening data center within each country. So that is a, a major shift in security uh, as as the network transform, their cybersecurity is transform, transforming. They are looking more for cloud security, a cybersecurity solution, and of course, cloud cybersecurity experts and expanding their footprint in, in into that. So adoption is going on. Many customers who, if you spoke to them three years ago, would say, oh, no, no, cloud is a taboo subject. Now it's talking about multi-cloud adoption and expanding uh, into the cloud. So that would be mm-hmm. one of the major things that's happening in the region. Yeah, I'm curious about that. So I, I remember when I was in region, they didn't have AWS. I think they would talk about having that in Bahrain, right? They were going to do an AWS uh, region in Bahrain? There is one in Bahrain. There is one in UAE right now, uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, Saudi uh, uh, region is expected to be uh, launched next year. It's the infrastructure building and all that is undergoing right now. Mm-hmm. There is Google region in Qatar and soon to, in Saudi. There is an Oracle region in Saudi right now and in UAE, Azure in UAE, I believe next year also in in Saudi and one in Qatar. So there are, as I said, booming in, in, in hyperscale mm. prisons within the region. Alibaba, I think, is supposed to be in Saudi by next year. It is booming and the country's regulator had kept pushing until they get what they want. I want the data center to be in my country first for economical reason to boost job creation, but also to ensure compliance with country uh, regulation and data sovereignty. Yeah. I remember we were dealing with that in Saudi Arabia, we had several clients that you and I serviced, and we had a few of them that got hit with that new regulation, that privacy regulation. And it said they had data sovereignty. And that's what you were just talking about. And one of the things that was just real difficult was the interpretation of the law. It was like, what does that really mean? Does it mean it can be resident, but somebody accesses, accesses it is still in the country? And if you remember, we had to get lawyers uh, out of Dubai to, to read that, and it was all in Arabic. And there was no a direct English translation. And I'm assuming those laws have been codified and, and, and institutionalized much better than they were, what, four, five, six years ago, right? Yes, it six years, five, six years ago, I would say that was a reactionary. That's, oh, I don't want, my data is going outside the country. I have to uh, impose a regulation to ensure data sovereignty, especially that's with the, it's always a response to changes in the laws in the U.S. So if, if in the U.S., you are giving the some federal authorities the ability to subpoena data stored within the U.S., then I want to make sure that for whatever reason, political or otherwise, my data cannot be subpoenaed. They cannot uh, force my hyperscaler to give up my data that could be confidential data and and so on. And the other one is also cybersecurity attacks. I don't want my data to be part of a major data dump or leak that's been here about. So 
five, six years ago, it was reactionary. Everyone just trying to make sure that I can control this. But it has matured within the, the past few years. The regulation had expanded. Better explained, there is now a better process if you want to adopt any cloud service that you can go to your regulator, depending on your industry. And there is risk assessment, compliance sheet, and all that. And if you provide enough evidence, it's easy. They will accept that. And they started certifying hyperscaler within the country. For example, in Saudi, uh, right now, I believe the only hyperscaler certified is Oracle. So because they have went to the National Cybersecurity Agency and, and, and they said, okay, here's our compliance with your regulation said, okay, fine, you are uh, compliant. So uh, there become a more of a process for any hyperscaler or cloud vendor to come in and say, I want to be certified. Hmm. Well, tell me this, and if companies from America wanted to do business in Dubai and do penetration testing for companies and so forth, how, how hard is it? Is the region really, they look for local providers, they're not going to look for pen tests from the United States, or what is the market like there in Dubai? In Dubai and across the region, there is trust with American expertise. They trust American vendors. They look at them highly. So I'll take this penetration testing because this is quite the sensitive subject. They want them to have, first of all, to have a local presence in the region. They will not uh, engage with an American company that does not have a local presence, uh, whether in Dubai or in Saudi, to have some sort of a regional headquarter. Especially if we are talking about big uh, customers and, and in this region, big customers are usually either government, semi-government, financial, oil and gas, and utility companies. All of these are highly regulated. So you, they will need you as a, a penetration testing or a cybersecurity company to do a consultation to have a local presence. Rarely occasion where anyone would engage with an American company that have no presence in the region. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think the threats are also geopolitical right now, just between the tug of war, the everything that's happening in the Middle East. And, and are we seeing an uptick in cyber attacks right now in relation to, I know we had Iranian season oil ships, and then you had the response the U.S. was putting U.S. Marines on ships there. Does that increase the cyber risk in region there? And, and it's always used as a tool of political influence, or is it everyday affair? You know? It is everyday affair. The cyber attacks, as I said, state-sponsored cyber attacks has been a constant within this region for the last 10 years, if not more. And always for like different reasons. So the I would say Chinese cyber attacks were property, intellectual property stealing, like looking for yeah. oil and gas, Economic data, storage, and so on. And then you have some of the right wing, like Iran sponsored attacks and, and some others, which more of a, a political activism, cyber attack meant for devastation and, and disruption. So it is constant. The cybersecurity market within the region is high for $5 billion annual. There is almost 10% increase in spending constantly. And they, and of course, they are looking always for the best in, of the best. So the top vendors in every domain are the ones that sort of, of after within this re region uh, because they want to this guarantee that I have the best uh, defense against any cyber attack. Yeah, it's interesting. And so I, I take it, do they have, do they consider the same type of stack as you think in the U.S.? It's that three-legged approach. You have the EDR, which is that that FireEye, that's that HX on the desktop. And then you have that second piece, which is the network IDS sensor for things that are like IoT devices. And they're not, you don't have an EDR product or antivirus. You need some kind of network full packet capture mm -hmm. PCAP. And then the third leg of that is the logging. You have to have event logging of a, uh, activity within an application, and those logs need to go somewhere that can be 
um, searched and, and correlated and so forth. So on those three levels, what do you think most companies in the Middle East do differently than the U.S.? Do you think it's the same approach or no? It, it is the same approach. So EDR, XDR, NDR is a big market within the region. The uh, top players within the EDR market, if we're talking about uh, CrowdStrike, Sentinel-1, Microsoft is cannibalizing a lot of the market share at the moment with their E5 approach. No, so that's US, become a step. I didn't know that was happening in the Middle East. <laughs> but, yeah, it happens in the yeah. U.S. here. Yeah, it's happening everywhere. EDR became a standard in most organizations. Like, rarely you will find an organization with more than 2,000 employees that don't have an EDR solution at the moment. So this, they will have EDR and antivirus at the same time as well. Because I want to have more protection. NDR are also uh, a stable in, in large organization. And definitely logging is, is something that is trivial to have a proper SEM solution with workflow management or SOAR attached to it or part of it. These become a standard for a few years now. So it, we rarely find a, a customer without any of these three solutions. And even some customers have multiple SIM solution in order to separate IT operation from cybersecurity operation and, and build more agile teams to respond to different threats. Interesting. So multiple SIM systems, one for the IT infrastructure. And yeah, that makes sense. You need a logging solution sometimes just for IT related events. And then where you correlate security related events. It's interesting. Yeah, and of course, full visibility is one of the things that benchmark any solution uh, when it comes to procurement is how detailed the logs are, how much information you can feed my SIM solution, and how much integration and correlation you can do. So things like a pre-built SIM application and dashboard is uh, considered a plus for any solution. You have integration with this SIM solution. You have pre-built apps that can be deployed on this SIM solution with pre-builds and, and data analysis. That's also considered a plus. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you were talking about as well is that everything just modernized. I remember when I was over there just a couple of years ago, EDR wasn't the standard. So you're saying EDR is now the standard. You've seen a huge jump in just maturity from how they're handling cyber threats. Now, do you still see the smaller companies, 2000 and below, do you still see them doing managed detection response, getting someone else to respond to uh, threats on those EDRs? Because it's really hard to staff those people internal with those skill sets 24 by 7. Oh, no, absolutely. Managed services is always has been always a key component in this region, as as many customers expect a ten key solution. So it is always if you want to deploy, I want someone from your side to come and deploy fully. I want this a ten key solution, as this region depends on expatriate skills. It's hard to get and staff people quickly, and and any vendor who wants to work in this region or service provider, it's going to be a major plus for them if they have their own staff. I, I can't deploy the solution and I will manage it for you. And also, if you want to manage such solution, there is the a local regulation that you have to meet. And, and it's a smart way for, from the government to ensure that there is job creation continuously. So if you want to do managed services for key Saudi, you have to do it from a center within Saudi. So that's how they ensure that there would be an increase in, in, in uh, job creation and also that the economy continue to grow. So uh, that is one of the approaches, but definitely most of the customer in this region would be happy to have any solution managed because it's very hard for them to hire staff and, and get highly skilled people to manage this solution. Yeah, and, and I remember you and I, when I was there in Dubai and I met with this when oil and gas company and they were saying, Josh, I really would like you to run these two projects between these two different departments. And I said, I, I don't understand. We do, we were at co at the time, so we do fishing, defense, and response. So it was like, I don't run big 
consulting engagements like this anymore, but why do you keep, need us? And it does seem to be to have those people in region that don't have pre-existing affiliations to different groups or tribes or anything like that. And mm -hmm. they've realized what works, what doesn't work and so forth. So I've, I've seen where the, what is the mix of that as having people in region, but all, all, all also having them in support. And I was just curious how the managed service model would work really if there is a requirement to have people in region all the time. How do you do the 24 by 7 follow the sun if there's a real strict need to have people in that region? You know what I mean? I, I completely understand, but it's also there is a flexibility. For example, they will accept that 8 to 8 will be from region, mm. something outside these working hours it will be but at least for from compliance and also because of the culture within this region the culture is always built around personal relationship they have yeah. to see the person they are working with so uh, you don't have to have the 24 7 within the region but at least eight to eight uh, to be from within the region they like to have someone that they can call on the phone during the day if they have a problem you can have an escalation manager that's work 24 by 7, but you don't have the entire team to be 24 by 7. Of course, there will be different cases depending on the customer size, criticality of that customer industry, uh, but most can go by just hiring 8 to 8 and then provide the support from outside the region, but at least someone within the region will be responsible to coordinate with the customer 24 by 7. Yeah, that's interesting. They value those personal relationships. I definitely, yeah, I, I definitely realize that one. I, I remember I made the mistake. We went in and they asked for coffee or tea. This was in Saudi. And I was just looking for a bottle of water. It was just so hot because it was hot outside. And then he says, coffee or tea? I was like, so no water? So coffee or tea? <laughs> I was like, okay, tea. And so it was, and then I find out later it was culturally, it was insulting to actually not take coffee or the tea. And he gave me like two, three bottles of water. I was like, hey, water's nothing. The tea or the yeah. coffee is what's important. And I think that was a exactly. cultural thing to know. Exactly. It is a show of respect to your host. And especially like when any company have people coming from outside the region, um, they consider them guests. So your host, whoever you are meeting, the top guy that you're meeting will consider himself a host. So a sign of respect to take the coffee or the tea. And also a few things that's definitely there's a, a plethora of articles online, but is sometimes the Westerners miss the mark on how to respect the the host. And and this is very important in, in this region because they value the personal trust. They are looking for a, a trusted consultant and in all aspects, not only just someone coming to sell them something and leave. They look at this as a partnership, a long-term relation. The personal aspect of it is very important. Yeah, no, no that makes a lot of sense. I think the, the whole follow the sun methodology too, as well. It's important. What I, one thing I learned why I like follow the sun and when you're trying to do 24 by seven, using people in region that you're operating is because of senior people don't want to work at two in the morning. They have families, they have kids, they've been doing cyber 10, 15 years, whatever it is. They're not going to want to do two in the morning, three in the morning. So why try to get senior people to work off hours? Why not? have it rotate through different regions as this, as we go around the world and let people have senior people on those day shifts and they're not working in the middle of the night. So we're trying to in, ensure you have that kind of function and that a kind of ability to switch between regions. I always thought was important. Absolutely. Uh, as I say, they just from regulation, that's to have people within the country, the region, also ease of access that I need people that mm -hmm. they can't even call WhatsApp, text <laughs> at 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, for a service provider, this person could be just at the coordinator and you still provide the services like L2 and L3 from outside the region. And 8 to 8, you can provide the services from within the region. That's the most uh, critical time. That would be acceptable. But as I said, like 
you will face a certain mega customers within the region who will demand that all the services coming from within the region. I want 24 by 7 from within the region. I want to have the phone number of everyone so I can call and yeah. escalate. Because hey, do you know my kids have, I have, we have a family story and my kids are teenagers now. And they had said, Dad, uh, for some reason, I, I, I just, I, I'm really pissed at, at Saudi Arabia for some reason. It was like a Christmas. And what my kids were talking about, and they unwittingly remembered this, is that there was a Christmas, on Christmas Day, we got called from the client in Saudi Arabia. It's one of the big oil and gas companies. And, and I was sitting down on the couch, and the kids were opening their gifts up. I mean, it was the day of Christmas, opening their gifts up. And I get a phone call from this director. And I immediately had to say, okay, stop opening your gifts. Hold on. I got dad's got to take this call. And for the longest time, the kids were just upset, but it was a head of security incident on that day. They were, they needed immediate response. And it was whether you're on holiday or not, it doesn't matter. And, and I understand their viewpoint when things pop off or, or on different and different time periods. I remember in when was in Saudi Ramco got hit by that wiper malware from Iran and it literally in 2012. Out thousands of drives and it cost Seagate stock to go up because they had to order millions of drives and pull it from other distribution chains. That's how big the attack was. Do you remember that? Yeah. It's uh, 2012, 35,000 machine got wiped in that attack. 35,000 machines wiped out. Uh, 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 and that was, I would say, a pivotal point in cybersecurity in this region because up to that point, cybersecurity was an IT attached function mm. and now it is not it changed the whole culture within this region it's opened the eyes of governments on the importance of cybersecurity regulation started to come out and also the increase in cybersecurity budget in many organization up to that point cybersecurity was an IT attached function so the CTO or CIO was the one controlling uh, the cybersecurity budget. Rarely you will find a, a CISO in a position or cybersecurity function independent of IT. Uh, but now this is the norm. And cybersecurity budgets had increased significantly. Uh, but also the awareness and, and I would say the hunt for more solution within this region and you find especially in, in large customers that's uh, they have teams doing research on new solution we're not going to use it right now we don't have the need for it right now but we want to learn about it we want to test it we want to know exactly what it can do mm -hmm. so when there is an additional requirement we can easily bring it in and know exactly what we will uh, be using it for they have their own independent team, but they also work with the major consulting companies, like the big four consulting companies. All major companies here also have affiliation with Gartner and Forrester to get up-to-date information about um, certain aspects of cybersecurity. Yeah. Let me ask you a few more questions here. Do you have the same risk, like, for instance, in the U.S., Chinese and Russians all over us, right? That's the common two actors that we see. You got some Eastern Europe and so forth. For the most part, a lot of Russians, a lot of Chinese. Is that same region in the UA, UAE? Who are the major players? Obviously, I think Iran is probably a major threat actor that you have there. Yeah, what Iran is, is, Iran mostly, they have their own. So you have, as I said, espionage is associated with many Chinese groups, but you will have also the Eastern European ransomware groups. Mm -hmm. Mostly it's targeting think, yeah. either phishing and, or fraud or targeting financial gains. But then you have the disruptive, which is the Iranian and some other groups. And these have their own experts. I would say that they have their own homebrewed malwares and, and attacks, but also they funnel expertise from North Korea, China, and Eastern Europe. Yeah, so a con conglomerate. And, and I remember exactly. when you and I were in South Africa, if you remember, we were presenting down in South Africa. We were in Johannesburg, I think. Johannesburg, yes. 
And they were saying a lot of the threats they were receiving were like USB or physical based or like malware on USBs and people were slipping yeah. USBs. It, it just seems like each key region's different. Just the same way we went to Sweden and we met those clients in Sweden. And they said that phishing used to be really low key. You could tell that it wasn't a Swedish national that wrote that. It was definitely somebody was with a Google translator or something. And yeah. none of them were successful. And then flash forward, he said three years later, it was like, you couldn't tell. It was so perfectly written. And then attacks went through the roof. It's almost like the attackers assimilate to that particular culture. Yep. So that is, that is true that you have a different regional concern and characteristic to the attack. And this is where m many Western European or American vendors, they don't understand the different cultures. The Middle East and Africa, uh, they some of them even think of it as one country. So you have different, so you have the Gulf countries, which is the region in the Arabian Peninsula between the Persian Gulf and, and the Red Sea as completely different culture and different types of attack than North Africa. And North Africa is completely different market than Sub-Saharan Africa down to South Africa because of different economical growth, different political situations. So that's one one part. And coming to the phishing attack, also like in this region, phishing attack in Arabic were laughable. <laughs> Just no no human had wrote this email. It's obviously primed with grammar and misspelling and all yeah. that. Now the, with the AI, and this is where it has become scary that the email is written and perfectly written, mimicking real email. You you hardly mm. will find any typos in, in these emails utilizing a generative AI uh, in, in phishing attack had become a, a, a thing uh, I personally have seen a lot, but also the attacker awareness of certain things. If they are targeting a certain customer, let's say in Saudi or UAE, it's not the generic phishing attacks anymore. The emails were written, they are related to a certain local events some, for example, in UAE, there was some initiative for updating customer information between the banks. So the central bank had this initiative called Know Your Customer, Know Your Bank. And you start seeing emails with actual logos of the bank and well-written emails re referencing this decision arriving. So they are upping their games. Hmm. No, that's interesting. And I, so, so I think that kind of is expanding to the kind of whole phishing realm and everything related to that and cloud. And I know the cloud was starting to really advance in that area for a while. I remember I was at that big oil and gas company and they were saying, if it, if the email comes in Arabic, they threw it away. But if yeah. it came in English, they would read it. I was like, wait a minute, your native language is Arabic. What do you mean you throw that away? Yeah, because there's so many fake emails in Arabic versus English. It's official business. Is it still like that? Uh, it is to a certain point. Like, for example, all government communication, like if semi-government or government entities, like municipalities and, and ministries, uh, for example, in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, their official communication will be in Arabic. Uh, versus uh, in UAE, where it's more multicultural English is the official so you rarely find something written in Arabic officially communicated uh, or it will be bilingual if there is some sort of a memo or decree it will be bilingual but for business like if private companies or semi-private companies like oil and gas and utility yeah definitely external communication will always be in English so they will not expect an official communication coming to them in Arabic and they will know that oh, this is probably phishing if I receive an email coming to me in Arabic about uh, a b business topic, business subject. I would, mm. we would want to deliver this to you or open the attachment to see the contract. Oh, they will definitely throw it away. I know Arabic is a difficult language. How does chat GPT handle Arabic? Have you noticed? Can you tell that it's <clears throat> AI generated Arabic versus native speaker? It is very good i have seen also not only arabic but also can mimic dialects mm. so i've been doing some testing and playing around like 
it can recognize uh, and generate in Lebanese dialect, Egyptian dialect. And we have something called Franco-Arabic, which is you write Arabic with the English letters. It's what's called Arabizi or Franco-Arabic. And it also can generate that and recognize that. Interesting. No, oh, I think we're getting to it one day when we're like the Star Trek. We have the little the little translator. You hit the button and it translates automatically to whatever language that is. And you just talk normally. I think we're almost there. Yeah, I, I still remember that story when I was flying into Daman, Saudi Arabia. And this was right after. Do you remember that drone was shot down in, in the Middle East in the Persian Gulf? And when I was flying back from Daman to Dubai the plane goes out into the Persian Gulf and like hugs the Iranian coast. I remember I was telling you the story. I was like, I was hitting the button for the stewards. Says, Look, can, can we move away from the Iranian <laughs> coast? They just shot something down. That seems so stupid for us to skim the Iranian coast there when something, they just shot something down. And that was like the day after, right after the day that happened. And I remember telling you, I landed in the airport in DeMont and it was Patriot missile batteries around the airport. I was like, man, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. <laughs> yeah, definitely. As I said, the, the situation always changing. Um, no one was expecting a physical attack on, on because there are, there is, I would say, caution from Iranian, not to repeat some mistakes that's happened during um, the 80s when they lost almost all their fleet in, in one day because they attacked the American vessel. But also, this is where these attacks were like, oh no, it wasn't from the state, it was from some group affiliated with someone in from a, a different country. Right now, I think that is quite behind us. As, as Saudi had took strategic diplomatic steps to ease the tension with Iran. So that was like, and still always the situation is no one wants to escalate. They use the cyber attacks and stuff like this for political gain. You probably with it. And a deniability. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The cyber attacks, you can get away with it. But at a certain point, I think probably uh, misreading the American continuous interest in, on, in, in protecting the region or trying to have political gain because of a certain internal situation in certain country. They escalated this to a physical attack. But, and that was the last one is like, the message was clear. This happened again, you're gonna be blamed. We don't care who uh, claimed the responsibility. It's your responsibility. These your affiliated groups. And that's de-escalated the situation. And also, followed by this political and uh, uh, movement to de-escalation, I think right now we are back to the normal situation where, you know, cyber attacks are <laughs> permissible. It's a fair game for everyone, but no physical attacks. Yeah, and what is the Saudi in the, you know, I guess, the Gulf region? What are they doing from a talent shortage perspective? Do you, are, are there big universities? How are they trying to train people? Are they trying to bring in expats all the time? How are they addressing the shortfall in our workforce? The Saudi had an education program on steroids for the past few years, uh, which is basically they are sending a lot of young Saudi to Western universities. This program had been very successful in, in creating the local skills that they need which led them that in certain cybersecurity domains, they can now regulate and say only Saudis can work in this domain. The leadership skills, the technical yeah. skills, but Saudi had the educational program in steroid for a few years now, which is basically uh, building universities and bringing expertise will take time. So what should I do? I send my people to uh, well-established universities, ensure they get their higher education, post-grad education in the best university in the world, and they come back and work um, in the country. So that has been going on successfully. Uh, uh, you see now a lot of talented and skilled Saudi and uh, Emirati and Qatari and Kuwaiti in leadership position, filling a lot of the cybersecurity skill set. 
And also, besides just the university and post-grad education, in many organizations and like central banks, they will send their cybersecurity experts six months to be trained by the big in big training boot camp like JIAC and SANS and et cetera. Building up these skills and maintaining these skills is very important and they spend a lot of money. Even private companies spend a lot of money on ensuring that I have the local skills because you cannot depend on expat. There's always the political element to it where certain countries say we're not sending our people anymore, we'll bring them back home and they can use this as a political leverage, but also in order to have a sustainable future. Uh, and they realize that in this region and they invest a lot in it. Kim, I so appreciate your time today and, and be able to cover the region of the Middle East and the Gulf states and how that cyber threat is different. What some of the regional concerns that you have and how do y'all view the cyber threat risk management landscape and how do you provide controls and tools for it? But any, any other parting words before we end the call? Yeah, uh, my advice for any vendor, there is huge respect to the American in terms of vendor or skill sets and services. But the only thing that's the caveat is you have to understand the culture. You have to appreciate the culture and be smart about it. And you need to have a local presence. You need to participate in the regional cybersecurity events such as Black Hat in Saudi, JISEC in UAE, mm. uh, because this is also boost the confidential uh, confidentiality in in in, uh, in you that's you are here we can reach you you have a physical presence here uh, many c companies had a huge success in the in this region where they are don't have the same success in other regions just because they have a, a very good presence and participation in all these kind of uh, local event it shows the respect and also shows commitment yeah. All right. Those are good, good points. I got called by an executive over at JISAC not too long ago about wanting us to sponsor a booth over there. So I definitely understand the need to be in the region. Thank you so much, Camel, for, for your time today. I think uh, I really want to thank you for all the things you did back in the years at CoFence. You were a phenomenal resource and a leader in that area. So I really thank you for that. And I hope to talk to you soon, my friend. Likewise. Thank you very much for having me. And I'll be looking forward to talk to you again. Thank you. And everybody stay secure. And I will be talking to everybody in this next episode. So thank you. Have a good day. Now, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, comment, share, and turn on those notifications so you don't miss an exciting episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cybersecurity America on the Voice America Business Channel. We hope you've learned some valuable information to help you be a better executive leader and navigate today's complex world of cybersecurity. Until next week, stay secure.